Welcome to the Just Women Sports Podcast, where we talk to the biggest athletes in the world about the untold stories behind their success. I'm Kelly O'Hara, and my guest today is Candace Parker. Candace, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for, for having me. Yeah, we're both in our respective bubbles, wobbles. Bubble, wobble. Yep. Bubble, wobble. Yep. Did you guys, you guys named it the wobble for, because WNBA? Yeah, it's the, it's the wobble. We're, we're making it out here. How about you? Are you good? Yeah, it's actually been much better than I thought it was going to be. Um, I realize I don't need that much to like enjoy life, you know? Um, how many days have you been in it so far? So we've been here like a week and two days. And honestly, okay. my expectations were so low. And I think right? just from playing all over the world, if you have high expectations, it's just, it's not realistic. So I think being into this situation, I didn't have very high expectations. And so I've been pleasantly surprised. Totally. I feel you. It's all about, life is all about setting expectations accordingly. A hundred percent. Yeah. All right. So we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to go back to little Candace days. Um, you come from a basketball family, but you didn't actually start really playing it until eighth grade. And up until that point, you were playing soccer, really? So what was, give me, give me a rundown on that. What was that about? I was the biggest soccer fan and player. And I will say it here, my parents completely crushed my dream because no. they told me that I was going to be over six foot. And they were like, you're not going to be able to play soccer. But you and, could have been um, amazing at soccer. Yeah, well, tell that to my parents. <laughs> um, no, I loved soccer. Um, that's what I played you know, that was my only sport really until I was like 12 or 13 years old. The 96 Olympics really kind of shaped my sports, I guess. Um, I was the biggest Mia Hamm fan. I was, you know, the, the Atlanta games was the magnificent seven with Dominique Mochianu and Dominique Dawes and Shannon Miller. I mean, I had a balance beam outside flipping and trying to be like them. So I grew up in like, that 96 Olympics is when it really was when I started like idolizing female um, athletes as role models. That That's actually exactly the same as I was, but I wasn't a big soccer fan. I played it, but the 96 Olympics gymnastic team was, was the, my first memory of seeing female athletes on TV and representing their country. And that changed my whole outlook on life. I was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do that one day. And I was watching gymnastics, you know, I had no idea it was going to be in soccer, but so how did you end up in basketball? Your parents were just like, Oh, you're going to be too tall. We're putting you in basketball. There was like a basketball in my crib ever since I was young. I went to my first game at two weeks old. My brothers are 11 and eight years older than me. Okay. And so I spent my entire childhood, like at EU tournaments, eating my snack, taking naps at games playing behind the bleacher. Like my moment was during halftime of my brother's AAU games. And it was like me running out on the court and people being like, oh, wow, she can kind of play a little bit. That was my moment to shine. But um, you weren't playing yet. You were just doing I it wasn't playing. We always went to the park as a family. We always just played around. I had a hoop in my driveway. And honestly, because I was such a big like, soccer fan and I wanted to play soccer, I kind of shied away from playing basketball just because I was like, that's my brother's thing. I want to do my own thing. They're really good at basketball. And so I need to find what I can do. And I started really playing at 12, 13 years old. Crazy. So what was that transition? Like, did you stop playing soccer completely or were you doing both and then eventually realized like, Oh no, basketball is what I want to do. I played soccer, volleyball and basketball um, for like a year and then it just got so crazy. And, um, so I kind of switched and started doing volleyball and basketball and it was kind of one of those things where it was, I, I, I was not, I do not have a goalie mentality. <laughs> and so on my next, um, I was going to play traveling soccer and I was, you know, forward, they put me in forward and I loved it. They tried to get me to play sweeper a little bit. I loved it. But then they tried to put me in the goal and I just don't have that mentality. And that was, that was it for me. you? 
and I think that was it. Like we had a practice and I dove for a ball and this girl kicked my finger. And I just remember being like, I don't want to play this position. And so that's kind of when I started switching and playing, you know, basketball and volleyball. And my parents were like, you know, it's volleyball, you're tall. It can work out. Basketball, you're tall. It can work out. Like soccer, you're getting like yellow cards because girls are like running into your legs and falling over and they're calling fouls on you. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's terrible. I it's wish a disadvantage, would've... honestly. Like no, I at know. that time, it, it really was. Like I wouldn't even touch anybody and I would get a yellow card. Like it was, yeah, it was crazy. I, I can imagine because just thinking <laughs> back, it's like if you were even a little bit bigger than somebody else, you, you were getting the fouls called on you, but I was getting all the fouls called for me because I was smaller. So, <laughs> um, so, but what was that? So what was that transition? Like at what point did you say, okay, basketball is what I want to do? Because I mean, you, that's, that's pretty late in life to start playing the sport, you know, a, a sport basketball organized and then to end up where you are today. It's really weird because when we were growing up, I mean, I played YBA, but YBA basketball was like, you know, you practiced on Thursday for an hour and then you came and played on Saturday and have fun. Um, but honestly, my brother got drafted when I was 11 and that kind of opened my eyes to like, that's cool. Like he got drafted to the NBA. I was there on the couch when he got picked. I was there watching him work out with my dad and all the cool things that came with that. And so kind of just kind of my wheels turn a little bit. Like I was like, this is kind of cool. So it, and it then, totally impacted your mindset. Yes, on. it did. It impacted um, my mindset. And I started, when you start making sacrifice for, sacrifices for your sport and that that's when you know it's like real. And that started happening in like seventh, eighth grade. Whereas instead of going to the mall or going to play miniature ball for go-karting with my friends, I went to the park and I went to the gym. And on Saturdays, I'd wake up and be like, dad, when are we? when are we going to the gym? You said we could go to the gym on Saturday. And that's when I kind of fell in love with like the process of, of playing basketball. That's awesome. Did you, did you know at the, like, did you tell your brother at that point? Like, Oh, I want to do what you're doing. Or was it kind of just like, Oh no, it's, it was like a little light switch in your mind. I want to do this. Or I want I to follow see, I tell footsteps him, kind of. I tell him all the time that like being the little sister, everything my brothers did or were doing was like the coolest thing I could ever think of. Like, I remember when they started driving, when they dunked, when they went to college, like I thought it was so cool. And then you get to that stage and you're like, I mean, it's cool, but I, you know, <laughs> you didn't love driving. Was. You didn't love I mean, dunking. I love driving, but I just thought of them as so much cooler. And my brothers always tell me it's cause I'm not cool, but <laughs> like <laughs> it just, so I don't know. It just kind of was like, I wanted to play basketball because they did and, and I wanted to do everything they did. And so it seemed like it was right. Yeah. I mean, so you go from getting into basketball, seriously, middle school, and then you end up having not only a dominant, but a historic high school career. You won multiple state titles, just about every national player of the year award, not once, but twice how do you, so was it, was it that light switch that propelled you into that? Or do you think you just naturally, you were like, oh, this, you found your calling. This was what you were meant to do. I'm such a individual that thrives on challenges. And ever since I was little, I think it's like the little child, the youngest child in me, like anything you tell me I can't do, I'm going to try to do it 10 times harder to the point where like my, my family kind of like pulls those strings and that's kind of how it was. I remember in eighth grade, my, uh, hi, my junior high coach was like, you know, I think you could be like top 10 in the state. And I was like, top 10, like in the state. He's like, yeah, I think as that's all in, you can probably as do. In, as in you, you couldn't believe that he was saying that you could be top 10 or were you like giving him a, a like side eye because you're like, no, I'm going to be number one. That's yes. I was giving him a side <laughs> eye. Like I'm, I'm about to be number one. And it was the same thing with you know, um, my dad threw me a tennis ball and he was like, you know, Anthony and Marcus, they dunked a tennis ball at 
you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, ah, just don't know if you can do it. And I spent that entire summer, like jumping, practicing my, in volleyball, I remember practicing my footwork uh, to try to, so it was just kind of like any challenge. And it annoys me because I know my family's doing it even to this day, but I still, because as soon as you say, I can't do something, like I'm going to try everything in, in, in me to do it. Totally. I feel you. We're, we're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> um, when did you realize you had it? You had what it takes to be not top 10, but number one. We were at our gym on a Saturday and we always went to this fitness center and worked out my dad and myself. And we were joking around after a workout and I took the ball and I went up and I, cause my brother's dunked at 16. So my whole goal, my entire life was to enter high school and dunk before my brothers did, you know, period. And then also in a game That's so, so that, that we finished a workout and I just went up and just, it hit off the back of the rim. And my dad looked at me and was like, do that again. I was like, well, I've gotten a volleyball down. He's like, you, you dunked a volleyball. He's like, you haven't dunked. A volleyball. I'm like, yes, I have. And I got up and I remember him showing me the footwork to, to go up and dunk and my hands are big enough. And so I just went up and got it. And then that was when I was like, yeah, I really want to do this. Like this is it. You get so much adrenaline and joy from like those type of just wins, you know, like it's like totally. every practice you have a win of some sort. And so it just was like in me. That's so you were 16. I was 14 when what? I, when I dunk. Yeah, I was 14 and then 15 and when I dunk. That I was is- long and lanky and just, man, um, what'd, your, I, my, what'd your brother say? My brothers didn't believe my dad. And you know, at that time there's not like camera phones totally. where you can be like, see, so I had to wait till Christmas for them to come home. So when they came home for Christmas, um, my brother was actually in the stands when I dunked the first time in a game. And I, that was the first time he ever saw me dunk. And so he couldn't believe it. And it's like a video of him like jumping up and down in the background with him and his, his wife. And um, it was so special to be able to kind of share that with, with them because we really, we, we joke with each other, but we're so supportive and they're always in my corner. So it's, yeah. it, it's really cool. And you can talk junk to your brothers. Like, you know, I tell their kids to ask their dads when they dunked and then, you know, <laughs> I love it. They can never get that back. They can never beat you now to being the oh. first, the youngest to dunk. That's awesome. Um, so you start dunking in high school. You realize that you're not going to just be top 10. You're going to be number one coming out of high school. You end up at Tennessee, which I feel like shaped you and your career so much. Um, and obviously the biggest part of that was, was Pat Summit. She's been a huge influence on your life. So take me back to the beginning of that relationship. How did she recruit you to Tennessee? Um, was there a specific pitch? Did she just show you her rings? Like what'd she, what'd she do? Honestly, it's so weird. Um, my first recruiting letter from Tennessee was volleyball. Really? And I got the mail. I went out and I will never forget this because my dad was like, Pat Summit doesn't want you. Like, you know, another challenge. Dad. So, dad. Yeah, my dad. He, he, he yeah, my mom, my dad. Yes, he did. And um, so I went out to the mailbox and I come running in with the, with the letter like, hey, dad, like I made it. You know, Pat Summit wrote me a letter. And I open it up and it's volleyball. <laughs> and when I tell you, <laughs> he t- let true. him tell this story. It's hilarious. My mom as well. But it was just, my parents really wanted me to play for somebody that was powerful on the court and did her job, but also a role model off the court. And Coach Summit was one of those people that was so influential in so many people's lives. And I realize it now more than I did then, how important it is to have somebody in your corner, to have somebody show you and teach you about life. And then now as a mother, I would, I would have sent my daughter there too. It was the expectations. It was the discipline. She walked the walk and she was just a great representation of what my, my dad wanted me and what my mom wanted me to be. And so it was just, 
it wasn't the easiest decision. I can't say that I didn't consider Duke or Texas or, you know, DePaul or Maryland, but it was, it was the correct decision for sure. Probably one of the best decisions of your life. Would you say? I would say it's one of the best decisions of my life. Yeah. But where I'd be right now individually, um, I think I'd be a pretty good basketball player, but as an individual, as a person, I think there's so much that I learned and just that, that amount of time. And then also just after what, so she's, she's known, like you said, for being incredibly tough as a coach, you know, in the, in the heat of competition, practices, games, all those things, but she's also so loved, um, by all of her players. So what, what was her secret, um, to striking that balance? Do you think, you know, so I'll tell you this story and then, you know, I don't know her secret, but I just know how our relationship was. My freshman year was really hard. I took ACL my senior year and I came back in five months from ACL surgery. Don't even ask me why it was dumb, but I played my senior year. I was happy, whatever. So I get to Tennessee and they're like, you know, we don't play on swollen knees. That's not what we do here. So I get an MRI they're like, okay, it's going to be six weeks or, you know, three months. And I'm like, ah, oh, please don't be three months. You know, your freshman year, you're ready to play, ready to show the world. This is what it's, you know, what it is, whatever. I get out of surgery and everybody's crying. My mom, my dad, Pat, Holly, our assistant coach. So the doctor comes to me and like, they're delaying the process, delaying the process. I'm asking, they're like, no, we want you to like really wake up. So you understand. Oh God. And the doctor was like, your knee is really messed up. Like, I don't know if you're going to, be able to play. I don't know if you're going to be able to play again, you know, whatever. And, you know, coach Summit grabbed my hand and was like, do you trust me? And I was like, you know, yeah, I trust you. She's like, we're going to get through this together. And when I tell you my freshman year was one of the hardest years, just because I had to redshirt that year, I had an exploratory surgery that actually ended up working out, um, had a total knee reconstruction. Um, my parents got divorced that year. And her door was always opened. And it, it wasn't like a forced conversation. It was one of those things where it's like her door was open and she would like, come do your homework in my office. There was no like, you have to talk. You, we need just to know that, I, that she was there. And I think it's that stuff that I remember more so than on the court, if it makes sense. Because I think she's sure. tough, 100%. But just to have that relationship with all of your and to be able to reach them in different ways and to know what pushes their buttons and you know what they need I think it it really takes a special person to be able to do that for sure I was just thinking I mean that's that's a character quality that not a lot of people have to be able to create trust and belief in somebody and just know like and just I, yeah, just trust, like support, just know that you're fully supported all the time, even though they're going to push you. But I love that story of that. Her door was always open, but it wasn't like a pushy thing. It was just a, I've got you, you're, you're far from home. You know, this is new environment. You're in a tough situation. You're going through hard times, but she opened that to you. And I guess to all of her players, which is like pretty special. I don't feel like many coaches can do that. And it's, it's one of those things where everybody knows her as a coach that you can like take what she says and write an entire book. I mean, the quotes that come out of her mouth are unbelievable, but she listened. And I think we forget so much in leadership that you have to listen. And I always say this and people laugh, but I'm like, honestly, coach summit set me up for failure because when I went on from Tennessee, I thought coaches did that. Like I thought that was automatic. Like, cause I had my dad as a coach. I had a really cool high school coach, Pat summit. And then I get to the pros and overseas and the Olympics. And it's like, some don't listen. Like they don't ever want to hear what you think you're just supposed to do what they say. And it's like, I don't know how you operate, but I, I am a communicator and I feel like everybody wants to take, yeah, ownership and, you know, to be able to have some sort of voice and whatever. I mean, um, you know, we're some of the greatest at what we do. And so to just completely be silenced to me is disservice to the team. And so coach summit, 
I mean, boy, like if you talk about empowering players, uh, she did that for sure. Do you have a good um, Coach Summit quote? For everybody, anything. That oh man! <laughs> so we had the definite dozen principles, okay. and every year before the start of the season, she would assign, you know, two two people usually, one person, one of the principles. Well, every single year, I got handle success as you handle failure, and for Good so fun. long, I was just like, okay, trying to make a point by giving this to me every single year. <laughs> and I get it, but I was looking at it like she thought I just was like, you know, needed to be brought down to reality. Like that's how I looked at it. So I was like, humble yourself, you know, humble yourself before you humble others. And like, I was doing all these quotes and she's like, you still don't get it. And I was like, what? She's like, when you miss a shot, you put your head down. She's like, but when you make a shot, it's next play. She's like, that has to be the mentality that you have. Like you put in the time, the results shouldn't matter. And I never looked at handle success as you handle failure because everybody assumes it's like a negative that you need to be humbled. But really it is like not being so hard on yourself when you aren't successful or you miss a shot or you're not having a great game. That's so good. I love that. So you got that every year or almost every Every year? <laughs> single year I got that. And then finally my senior year, I'm like, you could have told me this answer my freshman year. Like you wasted four years not telling me why you kept giving me this quote. Of me She's putting like, my well, head experience. Down. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, so. Well, she wanted you to really get it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Well, you guys, you two had an incredibly successful run together. Back-to-back -to -back NCAA championships back-to-back -back NCAA Tournament Most Outstanding Player Awards, back-to-back -back National Player of the Year Awards. And looking back, what does it mean to have been on the last two title teams that Coach Summit coached? It's nuts because I think when you're going through it, you don't think of it that way. Totally. Um, it's one of those things where – I look back and I wish I would have been a little bit more present. And I think everybody has those wishes when they don't experience, you know, when they experience something and they know that that's the last time or it's super special. Um, but I think she, she knew uh, how special our group is and she knew that we love her and that I love her. And, you know, to be a part of that, I mean, that's something that, yes, do I wish she would have gotten more after we lo we left? Um, for sure. But to be able to go back and have those memories, I think it's, I mean, we go back and watch a game sometimes when I'm on the Peloton, I'll pop in a, you know, YouTube game or whatever. And it's so great to see, um, how fun and you don't even realize it in college, you know, you're just playing, but how much fun it actually is and how great of an experience totally agree with you. It's so true. You don't realize that you're so, you're so caught up in the stress and the pressure and wanting to win. And then you don't even realize what you have ahead of you and what you have right in front of you at the moment. I feel like, I feel like my professional career has taught me how to enjoy the journey and not get too stressed out about what's, you know, right in front of you. Just enjoy it. Um, you look but, up and it's, you know, it's crazy. Like, Time literally has wings. Um, 100%. It really does. And you don't realize it at the time because it's like freshman year, let me get to my sophomore year. Then sophomore yep. year, it's like, oh, I'm an upperclassman now, junior year, okay. And then senior year, you're like, whoa, wait a second. This is my last year. And, you know, I think it's a gift and a curse because I think we are who we are because we always are like, what's next? Totally. And what can we achieve next and what's our goal? But then – in the meantime, you kind of lose sight of being present. So I think it definitely is a balance. Yeah. So you, you obviously crushed your college career um, and you ended up, you, like you said, you redshirted your freshman year, played sophomore, junior, senior, but really it was freshman, sophomore, junior. If you're looking at it in terms of eligibility, you declared, you said you were going to go to the draft um, in 2008 and you end up getting drafted first. Was that something where you like, I, I'm ready to go pro. I've done what I've done here. I'm, I'm ready for the next chapter. 
I was, I was ready. And it was a decision that I think was right. Um, I walked in senior night, so I was able to experience that and, and celebrate, you know, playing for Tennessee. So I just felt like the timing was right. And we won back to back national championships. I was going out with the class that I came in with. I had a degree. Um, and it was just time for me to, to move on. And I was very <laughs> appreciative of the years Tennessee gave me, but I was definitely ready. Yeah. I mean, you clearly were ready because you come out, you get drafted number one, and then you end up getting rookie of the year and you're also league MVP in your first season. And WNBA is famous for being one of the hardest leagues in the world for a rookie to, to crack and to be successful. And so how did you have, why, why do you think your transition was so successful from college to pro? I played USA basketball with the senior national team ever since I was a freshman in college. And with that came a lot of experience of playing against, you know, players that were experienced that were some of the best world. And so, you know, to have that opportunity, I think really helped me and prepared me. I also believe that playing alongside Lisa Leslie, one of the best players to ever play the game of basketball, I mean, helped me tremendously because how long were at you some playing, point, how long were you playing with USA basketball before you turned so I pro? played with USA basketball three years okay. before I, you know, I turned pro and it helped me a lot because I was yeah. playing against, I mean, all of the best in the entire world. I remember going out there in my first USA basketball senior national team, I was guarding Lauren Jackson. Like, you know, it's just like, well, all right. <laughs> I guess there's the no time to, in. yeah, I guess there's no time to break anything in. So it was just like, that's, you know, that was my experience. And it was just kind of one of those things where it was like, you got to take it in stride. I was playing on a great team. I know a lot of rookies into the league and they lose for their first couple of years because their team isn't good. That's why they got the number one pick. And for me, it was just Lisa was, had her daughter the year before. So she's out. Sparks had a bad record. So I got on a great team. That's awesome. So you also leave in college, you signed a lot of big endorsement deals, um, Adidas, Gatorade. Were you, do you feel like you were ready for that adjustment period? Like for me, when I left college, I had no interest in, I was just like, put me on a team. I don't, I don't even, do I need an agent? You know, that sort of thing. But you came out of college and, and you know, blew up off the court as well. Rightfully so, considering your success on the court. But how did you... Like, how did you deal with all the business decisions of becoming a professional athlete? I leaned on my family a lot. There's not much time. A lot of people don't know this, but when I was in college, you won the national championship and literally my hair still smelled like champagne, which were, I was 21. So I was about to say, what are you drink. doing? <laughs> yeah. I was 21. And when you okay. win a national championship, especially in Tampa with your family, I had champagne and <laughs> and all that my hair still smelled like alcohol the next day like I had to get up and try to take a shower and wash my hair and and get ready for the draft like we get drafted the very next day so wow. I had to kind of handle the agent and all that stuff before the final four uh, because it's just so tight and so I my family helped me a lot my brothers my mom my dad they all helped me make a, the best decision for me. And I had a great agent and he, you know, he represented me and had everything lined up. There's a short time between when the draft is and when the season starts. And so it was just kind of honestly looking back, I don't even know how, like it was just back and forth and okay, you have this and you got to, now I got to pack up my apartment in college and say goodbye to people that I've been with for four years. And it was a whirlwind for sure. Yeah. But so exciting. I, I remember that. And I was not, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't signing with Gatorade by any means, but I just remember being like, I have no interest in this, but you clearly crushed it. And then, like I said, you backed it up on the court. So 
when you went into that season, were you, did you put those expectations on yourself of like, I want to be rookie of the year? Like, was that in your mind or were you just out there trying to be as successful as possible? Did you want to be like, were you thinking, oh, I want to be MVP. I have something to prove. I went into the season, like, I just want to win. I kept saying about the triple crown to win an NCAA championship, to win an Olympic gold medal, and to win a WNBA championship in one year would be insane. And that was my mentality. And when I walked in there and said that, Michael Cooper was our head coach with the LA Sparks, and he was like, nope, you need to go for a rookie of the year and MVP. And I was like, what? He's like, I'll be disappointed in you if you do not get rookie of the year and MVP like that's what you should that should be your mentality and you know they they were tough I mean (laughs) our my rookie season Coop was like that Pat Riley mentality so we practiced two day two times a day for 21 straight days I will never forget how my body felt I mean we worked for it so that season was by far not easy at all um but, you know, we had, we had a chance and I'm still salty about losing that year. But anyway. <laughs> but you got a gold medal out of it. Got a gold medal. Uh, we won the Olympics in 2008. And um, it's unbelievable when I look back on that year just because I got pregnant with my daughter that fall. And I was at- actually at the Olympics so to stand on the podium and get a gold medal pregnant with my daughter, I did not know. Um, and then to win rookie of the year and MVP pregnant with my daughter, you know, she looks at pictures to this day and is like, yeah, like we won. Like that's, I was in there. I'm in this picture. I love And that. it's so cool to, um, to be able to look back and say that. So that's leading me into my next couple <laughs> bits of questions on motherhood how how did that change your approach to your career both on and off the court was was this something that you'd always wanted to be a young mother or was this something that you know it was a a a beautiful miracle and you're like all right this is this is what's happening this is my next chapter anyone that knows me I always even growing up I was babysitting at 11 12 years old I always had kids on my hip I'm like most proud aunt you'll ever meet in your entire life. I always wanted to have kids young. Um, I won't say she's planned, (laughs) but she definitely was like the best thing or the best decision, the best choice, the best, whatever you want to call it I've ever made in my life because it was, I mean, it's so special. I can't even put into words and every single day it's just more, um, just joy to be able to look back on your career and to have somebody that's been a part of it. And you kind of grow up with your kid at this point. Um, you know, she's 11 now and like we hang out. It's weird. Like she's like my buddy. She kind of takes care of me. Like my friends laugh and joke like Layla's not around, huh? Cause I forget stuff when she's not there. Oh my God. She literally like takes care of me. And so it's just, I'm so happy that she like picked me. I always tell her all the, I'm like, I'm so happy you picked me to be your mom. Cause like all these other kids, like, I just, <laughs> I'm so glad you're my kid. She's yeah. like, I, I, I picked you. She's like, I, there was, there was another little boy and a little girl and they wanted you and I, I fought him for it. Like that's what she always says. So <laughs> I love that. Well, she's a reflection of you, which is, you should be very proud of. Um, but how did you, so how did you balance being a mom and a pro athlete, were you, I mean, were you scared? Were you excited? Were you not sure? I, at that point, you're, you know, you've only had one, one year as a, as a professional athlete, but already honestly, accomplished so much. Honestly, I just remember um, announcing I was pregnant and everybody being like, how could you do this? Like, I remember that feeling. As in like, they were upset with you? Like they were upset. Like, how could you come off winning rookie of the year and MVP and then now you're pregnant? And it was like, it was weird. I don't know. It was like, and nobody was going to dim my light because I was so excited to, to have a child and to For be sure. pregnant. And I had already set and circled on my calendar when the schedule came out, what game I wanted to come back. I stayed in shape throughout my pregnancy. Um, I, I hit it pretty well until like February. And then it was like, all right, 
there's no way I'm just fat in my gut. Like <laughs> people are starting to know this. Um, but honestly, it was just kind of one of those things where it's like, I didn't really know any different. It's always been her and I, and that first year, I mean, that's, that's why I always tell her, I'm like, there's one of you because it was, it was difficult. It's hard. It was, I mean, nursing at halftime on the road, bus rides, traveling to Russia, um, airports, um, her first steps were in Phoenix. It's just, she crawled in Istanbul. Like, I, I mean, it's just been like, it was difficult, but we made it work. And she honestly, and I say this, she is the easiest kid. I mean, just the greatest disposition, happy about everything. You can give her a box and she'll play for two hours. Like she entertains herself. Like she honestly, like the universe knew what I needed because <laughs> it was just, that's, I mean, that's how it's been. And so we just kind of balance. Yeah. Um, balance so she things. traveled, she traveled with you everywhere. So I nursed until she was 14 months Okay. and she wouldn't take a bottle. So she went everywhere. everywhere. I went. Literally, I could not be away from her for more than like two, three hours. Um, and it's funny because she only would act up during the playoffs. So, no yeah, she would go crazy during like she knew. I, I don't even know how she knew, but she would just decide to like cut a tooth or have a fever or something during the playoffs. <laughs> Do you think she could feel the pressure? I feel like she felt it and she knew I needed something to take my mind off it maybe, but um do you yeah. feel like that's been a thing where I mean I feel like I've I've a lot of um mothers who are still playing talk about how you know they play a game and win or lose they turn around their child's right there and they realize what life is really about regardless of what happens on the court on the field that sort of thing is that something that you have you felt quickly in becoming a mother I was one of those people I hated to lose like to the point where it was, it was like, I would stay up at night and like, I would not be able to sleep and have an attitude. And like when our season would even, and this is even when she was little and it got to the point where I remember one year we lost in the playoffs and we had been a number two seed and we were supposed to win and it was all this and all that. And we lost on another second shot. And I came home and my best friend always, you know, <laughs> she's like the one that brings like the chips and like the movies and comes over and like we lay in bed all day and like watch movies and are sad. And Layla came in and was like, mom, you're in bed still. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do this. Like this is, you know, I gotta, it, there's more to life than this. And so it kind of, kind of shifted. Like when she was like three or four, it got to the point where it was like, there's more to life than just basketball. And Obviously, she changed that when she was born, and she came first 100%. But just like the win-loss thing, like you do what you do, you go out there. As a parent, I'm saying these things to my kid, but if I don't do them, then she's not going to she's not gonna know that that's what you're supposed to do. She's watching what I do, not what I say. For sure. And so that's kind of when the switch was when she kind of knew what was going on and could verbalize, and I was like, you know, yeah, that's, that's not really what I'm teaching you, so I'm going to have to start doing it. She could see you in bed all day with chips and ice cream and be like, nah, mom, you can't, you can't be doing that. We can't act that way after a loss. Oh, that's She's great. Like, you're eating ice cream at nine in the morning? What is little, going on? A little bit of guilt. Um, <laughs> so you, you have Layla, your second, you're going into your second season, WNBA, um, and then your third and fourth season in the league, you had a series of injuries, kept you out of play. Um, how hard was that to have such a phenomenal first year in the league and then kind of come up on these obstacles and um, I mean, just hard times in general. I've had seven knee surgeries um, and I've had one shoulder surgery. And I remember when I got hurt in college, Coach Summit made me go talk to, you know, one of those sports psych psychologists. One of those. <laughs> and I was just in there like rolling my eyes, like, I don't need this, you know, da, da, da. And then it really like made me think as you turn into like, why me? And you look at the other side and there's so many people that can't play 
because of injuries and I can, it's just a little bit more difficult. So instead of looking at all those that didn't have injuries and never had a problem and never had anything that was really a, an obstacle, look at it the other way. Like people couldn't play or how many people had surgery and their knees didn't hold up or didn't have the care that, that I did. And so when I started flipping the switch that way, it made it a little easier. I was so sick of rehab that year. I had my daughter, then I had shoulder surgery. And then I had, I came back from shoulder surgery healthy and I banged knees in our early game. It was like the sixth or seventh game of the year, broke my knee. Like it was just, <laughs> it was like, I was the bad news bears. Right. But I just kept at it and people around me just continued to motivate me. And it, it really, it, I will say, I think basketball career would have been a lot better, obviously without injuries. But again, as a person, I just don't think you, you can. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's uh, definitely scars, but it taught me a lot in life. For sure. I feel you on that. It's so true. I, if you don't go through it, you wouldn't, you don't know. And as hard as it is when you're in it, when you get past it, beyond it, and you can look back, you're like, oh, I, I learned a lot. And I, you know, experience. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm better for it, even though it sounds crazy. It's true. <laughs> um, so 2010, we got to talk about Russia because Russia playing overseas is like a big thing for WNBA players. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know how common it is that you guys go abroad. So what went into your decision to head to Russia? So weird. I was supposed to go right after my rookie season. I had signed to play in Ekaterinburg. I actually signed at the, at the Olympics to play um, that summer. And then I got pregnant with my daughter and it was like, all right, so can we delay this thing till next year? And so they delay until the following year. So it was me in December with a five month old baby. We took 12 suitcases over to Russia. Cause I was like, <laughs> Like as an American, you hear all these things. So I brought like diapers. I brought oh, okay, Gerber okay. baby food. I bought like all the stages of whatever we needed, everything. Like they okay. didn't have anything. And I get there and there's everything that I have in my suitcase in Russia. But that's beside the point. But I think <laughs> it was, I mean, it was a huge step to take a, you know, five, six month old baby overseas. I mean- this yeah. cold environment in America, you don't hear much positive about Russia, but honestly, it ended up being one of the best experiences we've had. Um, it really is. And we really did a good job. My mom came with me to help me with my daughter and got involved in the culture. My daughter's first school was there. She spoke a little Russian. Wow. It ended up being like a really good experience. And I was able to be there for like six years. Um, so it was, it was a great experience. What, what was the, like, why was it such a good experience? Just because it was different. It was new. Like I've been to Russia once, never need to go back. So <laughs> a lot of people was, say that I was also only there for like a month during uh, 2006, like youth world cup. Where did you guys play at? What, we played in city? Moscow and we played in oh, St. Okay. Petersburg. Um, but got my fill yeah. of Russia. But you went back multiple years. Yeah, I was there six years. And I played for one of the best clubs in Europe. And we had drivers. We had amazing apartments. We had we flew private. Um, so a very chefs. different experience than playing yes. in the WNBA hundred percent. Like I call everybody's like, what's your off season job? And I'm like the WNBA. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, I mean, how you feed your children and take care of your families overseas. Uh, yeah. So why, why is there so much money in Russian women's basketball? Rich owners? I like, have no idea. I mean, you don't, you don't ask it. questions. <laughs> I just, yeah. I just make sure it's in the account. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like it's here this month. Okay. Uh, no, they honestly use it as kind of like a bragging 
like talking point at dinner. Um, we had one of the richest men in Russia and companies, um, that owned our team. So we would have parties and like by the fourth year, it's like first year you're like, Oh my gosh, these parties are unbelievable. And then by like the fourth year, like another party, can we like, and I'm saying like top of the line vodka and dancers and music and all this stuff. And it's just like, it, it really was a great experience. That's amazing. I mean, I just think of my Russian experience and not the same. But <laughs> you have it. Do you, can you give me? You gotta any, give it another. You gotta I give know. it another chance. Can you give me a a crazy story? Some some crazy Russian story. Got anything good? Come on, the people want to know. Let me se- let me censor it. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, vodka and dancers. So let's you can see. Um. Crazy Russian stories. Or just like wild, like I this mean, would never happen in America. in America. Oh, there's like a million of those. Um, let me think. I would say just the people are, you cannot listen to the tone in which they say stuff. Because we always had um, a Russian player on our, tel- on our team, you know, whatever year I was there that spoke really good English. And you would tell them to say something to a waiter for you to order like chicken or I, I don't want sauce on my chicken. And they would say it in a way that you, it was like so harsh that you're just like, okay, so what did they say? And they're like, no, they said it's fine. And you're just like, that's not how you say it's fine. Like, why are you so angry when you say it? But then you really get to know the people and they're really nice. And the funny thing is, is like Layla was a kid there. And so she would go to the playgrounds and all the kids would look. And, you know, at first I think we got offended because you know as african americans traveling you're like oh they're staring at her because she's black and like whatever and no they just had never seen a, a, a kid before yeah so they all come over and this one kid tries to get up enough words and says i love your hair and she and he's like can i touch it and layla's like one time <laughs> so he touches her hair and then they run and play and it's just Aww. like it's so cool to see that, like we're really not that different like yeah. we really you know we love we have kids we have a family we have friends we like to have fun and that's like every culture um that's so, so it was it's really cool yeah that's awesome so has, does Layla still can could she speak a little bit of Russian if she tried she has not Kept spoken Russian it? that kid <laughs> um I was trying to get her to and you no I can understand I can okay. speak a little bit Choo choo, but like, I can understand and like I can get by. It's been funny when I'm on an elevator and like somebody says something about me, and I'm like, oh, that's not very nice. Like when I get off, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. All right, so good vodka, nice kids, yeah, answers, great vodka, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so jumping ahead to 2016, another big year for you, um controversially you're left off of the Olympic team. It's a decision. A lot of people question. And then on top of that, um, you know, coach summit passes away during the WNBA season. From that moment, you dedicate the season to her and you go on to win your first WNBA title, your finals MVP. I feel like this is like kind of a Hollywood movie. Like, sad but like so you know wonderful in the end um and so just walk me through that year and just everything that that happened I mean I feel like that's kind of a loaded question but um (laughs) I mean that'd be probably difficult to answer but yeah just give me kind of some insight into into what that was like so many lows and then having ending on such a high it was definitely an emotional year. I think just personally as well as professionally. But I have a really dope circle. I honestly do. And I think it's in those times that you don't waver because you know you have people that are supporting you and behind you and love you and care for you and want what's best for you. And so 2016 was a difficult year just you know there were a lot of things that um 
right. We're unfair. And I knew it. But it's also one of those things where I had to go back to like my roots and that's kind of when I developed the mantra of like calm is a superpower because there's a lot that I think should have been a, a certain way, should have been this, should have been that, but it's like because I didn't throw a fit because I didn't act crazy. I look back at that like I'm not the fool that year, you know? Um but also coach summit meant and means so much to me and so much to me as a basketball player. And so I just don't think it's a coincidence that I got my first WNBA championship. Like I knew she was watching. It's crazy. Um, and you know, the, the, the day she passed, we had a game that night and I remember trying to figure out, you know, how I was going to get the, I would say just the inspiration to play. I mean, I think, you know, when somebody passes away, you want to honor them, but it's like, sometimes you just don't have the energy, you know, you're just so overwhelmed and emotional and things like that. And so that night I just was like, let's, you know, I'm just going to go out there and play for her. And I ended up getting the most amount of rebounds that I got all season and I could hear her every time, like Parker, go to the boards, Parker, go to the boards. Cause that's all she talked to me about in college was just rebounding, 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 all that. So that night it was just like, there's all these things that yes, they're somewhat in my control, but it just happened that way. And so 2016 was a year that there are a lot of things that happened, but because of my dope circle and just because of the qualities that I've been able to develop through other obstacles that I've faced. I mean, it didn't break me. And so, like you said, with injury, when you look back and you're like, like that year, there were some obstacles and obviously um, coach summits passing, but at the same time, it's like, it was another way of her making me better. You know, it was another way of her like, giving me something and, and being there and supporting me. And so I just, I'm thankful. And I don't think I look back at 2016, like that was just a terrible year. You know, I, I kind of look back at, for it and I have a lot of gratitude just because you realize so many things when you, when you go through a, a trying time like that. For sure. I mean, yeah, it's, you, you said it perfectly. And at the end WNBA final, you the confetti streaming down you look up I watched this and I almost started crying before we got on here and you said this is for Pat and it was such a powerful moment I, I might get emotional now but like what was it like to reach the pinnacle that you hadn't reached yet given all that had happened like what what did that mean to you to me I just knew she was there and I knew she had something to do with it. She's been so influential in my entire life, not just in basketball, the way I parent, the, the type of teammate, um, the daughter, the friend, the wife, the everything. Um, and I realized like you're never really a finished product. And so it's just kind of like all those things came to me at that moment. It was basketball, but it was like more than that. And it was more of an achievement as an individual as well, because I don't know if you, like I could have gone ape shit and just went off and like, you know, I could have done that and yeah. I could have acted a fool and people probably would have been like, okay. Um, but I wasn't raised that way and I sure wasn't coached that way. And um, so I think at that moment, it was just kind of all these things and all these reasons why I wanted to yell. It was like, she was right again. Like we, I got what I wanted. <laughs> Our yeah. team won the championship. It was almost like, I hear you, Pat. Like, this is for you for sure. Yeah. That's so special. And it's so true. I mean, I feel like it's like you can, when you hit hard times and when basically when shit hits the fan, like you can easily have an excuse to go off the rails. And I feel like that's happened to me a couple of times, probably not publicly, but like then you realize like, no, this isn't the person I am. Like 
this is about resiliency and that's how I was raised. And that's, like you said, that's how I was coached. And I mean, that's a testament to you and the people, like you said, you have a tight circle and that's, that's pretty special. Um, it, can you say any more on the Olympic decision? Was that something that was kind of out of left field or did you, did, did you kind of have a feeling like, Oh, I'm, I'm not probably not going to be on the squad this year. Um, how did you, how'd you handle that? It's interesting because it never occurred to me at all that I would be left off the team just because one, I'm one of those like performance based people and like the training camp that I gave up time because I was going overseas and you know, with the women's basketball, it's like, it's a tight schedule. So if you want us to do three weeks of training camp and we're going overseas, that's three weeks away from home. That's three weeks, not being in America. That's three weeks before I got to travel and, you know, time away from my daughter and all that. So we went on a training camp to Spain and Italy and I played some of the best basketball I think I've played. I mean, I almost had a triple double one game. Like it was just, it was great. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm one of those, like, if you say something like, say it, you know, if you say something, mean it and back it up and do what you say. And so that's kind of how it was like, I played well, so why wouldn't I? It wasn't a question. So then I knew that I wasn't crazy when uh, Alan, a head of basketball, called and was like, you know, we have so much respect for you. We want to give you the opportunity to say, you, you know, you, you're pulling out of the Olympics. And I was like, hell no, I'm not doing that. Like, y'all really? come out and say, you guys cut me. Yeah. Wow. So this is a conversation. And so Good this is you. how this is how one of those, you know, this is – and listen, I respect everybody that's on the team. This has for nothing sure. to do with that. But at the same time, it's – Tell it like it Just is. Tell it like it is. Like if you think that, you know, it's not about talent, it's about this, whatever, then say it. Don't say that I'm not good enough to be on the Olympic team. And so, um, and then I kind of came to the decision too. the next year, you know, I got a letter and I got a call and like, you can come to training camp and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to set an example for my daughter in terms of like, if somebody doesn't treat you the way that you feel like you should be treated or disrespects you in a way that I'm going to go back and play. I'm going to give up my time again. I'm going to like, I'm cool. Like my grandkids can have them, you know, like they have something to remember me by, I guess. But at, at some point it was just like, I'm done. I'm not about to go through this again. And so, um, yeah. So I, I mean, hundred percent do I think I'm good enough to be on the team. It's like, of course, because otherwise they wouldn't have asked me to, we have so much respect for you to pull out of the Olympics. Yeah. So, um, but at the same time, like looking back, I mean, the way my knees are and the way my body is like, that's time, that's energy, that's grind, that's pounding. Do we get the 2016 championship if I go to the Olympics? I don't, I don't know. So there's a lot of question marks, but yeah. Um, you know, my, my time with USA basketball is done though. Sometimes that's just the way it is. You know, I respect the fact that that's how you've approached it and Hey, you got your WNBA title that year. <laughs> so <laughs> came out on top. Um, all right. So social advocacy, get into this mm -hmm. just a little bit. Um, so the WNBA as a league is at the forefront of so many important conversations today around racial justice gender equality. Um, why do you think this league attracts so many confident, outspoken players? Because we're the my majority of the minority. If you I think about this. our league. I saw, I saw you say this the other day and I loved yeah, it. Yeah. We're, we're 80% African American. We're women. So we're a hundred percent women. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. for sure. That's yeah. one thing that you can count. 80% African American. We come from different social economic backgrounds, um, sexual orientation, you name it. And that's the minority in the world, but the majority in our league. And with that being said, I think it goes with like, we really take this seriously of leaving the game better than we came into it. And I don't know if it's just talk, like it's action. A lot of people can talk about stuff. And you're, you're saying you don't know if right now it's just talk it's actually action. Are you saying no? No, we're, I'm we're saying it's not just talk. It's going yeah. to be 
action. And yeah. um, we're a league that has been at the forefront when it, nece- it wasn't necessarily cool to, to speak out and to, to put your neck on the line. And so I do believe um, we have to, because if we don't, I mean, looking who's around going to, exactly. yeah, like who's that's going how I feel to? about how, that's how I feel about things. It's like when I first turned pro, I looked around and I was like, Oh, somebody else will do it. No, we're the ones who have to do it. Mm-hmm. What do you, what do you think needs to happen to get more people or more women in leadership positions? Cause right now what you're saying is the minority, which is the major, the majority of the league, which is the minority in this country, isn't reflected in leadership positions in WNBA. So how do, how, how does that happen? What do you think needs to happen? Well, for me, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, layered, um, it's complex, huh? There's a, there's a lot. I'm a huge believer in I don't know if you've done the Harvard implicit bias test, but it's honestly shocking because I am one of the biggest feminists that women can do anything men can do and da, da, da. But it's like, there's this, these implicit bias that we have that are in us. And it starts from a very, very, very young age. And I have so much hope for this young generation of young girls and young boys because they've grown up and they've seen a variety of people in different roles. And in order for us to honestly see people and see who they truly are and to, to speak about equality or even nearing that, one, you have to be able to read about it and you have to see it and it has to be represented. And it has to be represented in different roles. Um, you know, the, the longstanding joke of like, not the joke, but the riddle of like, a son is brought into the emergency room. It's not his dad. The doctor oh, says, yeah. oh my gosh, I can't operate. Who is this? And people are like stumped by it. And I'm like, it's the mom. Like, <laughs> why can't the mom be a doctor? Like, how is this hard? But it's, but it's like so that, true. Type of, that type of stuff. Visibility is so important. Visibility is so important. Um, I think it's that, but it's also people holding their organizations accountable. I don't necessarily know um, how we get to a point of a di- a di- diverse table. But if you don't respect the person, you're never going to hire him. Like if you don't see him in a role, you're never going to hire him. And you know, like if in 20, 30 years you have a corporation and start and somebody puts soccer on their resume or something like that, you, immediately you're probably going to be attracted to that. You're going to be like, oh, like that's an interest. Like, okay, where did you go to school? Like, where are you from type of thing? That's what it is, honestly. You hire the people that have the same interests, the same background, the same education. And so right now we're kind of in a cycle in our country that that's what's happening. And so I do believe in having scholarships, having action plans with organizations of the amount of people that they have to at least interview. Um, The challenges that I face individually when you're speaking with somebody that you're not comfortable with or it doesn't look like you, you're not yourself, you know? And so when you walk in as an African-American or as a person of color or as a woman into a boardroom of all white males and you're expected to have a amazing interview with no jokes, no similarities, no jokes. I mean, what are we, where are we, you know, what are we, what's our common ground here? Has that happened to you? It's really funny. I have this story. We were on um, the shop with LeBron show. So I was sitting there. First of all, John Stewart is like my hero. I watched him on the daily show every single day. So he was sitting next to me. It was Draymond Green. It was LeBron. And they were sitting there and talking about, they're like, do you know how hard it is to be a black man and walk into a boardroom meeting? And (laughs) you're the only black man. And I was like, so I'm the only female, like, I appreciate y'all. Like, thank you for including the female voice and African-American voice. I get it. But like, yes, hell yeah. That's where, that's my work environment. Um, but I think it's important for us to establish, like, I'm not trying to be like one of the guys. Like, that's my, my goal. I want to be a, one of the players. And I, I established that early at TNT was like, my goal is not to like be a dude with y'all. Like, that's not but also like we're going to have a, a, a respect and 
fortunately, like I've had teammates that, that have, and it's just trying to encourage others to kind of break through and challenge those norms and to help other people out. I mean, I think as women, we we're taught there's only one slot, so we don't really help each other out. And it's not our fault. I think it's the system's fault, but we got to do more of that. For sure. I've, in just speaking with you tonight, you, you clearly have a big picture mindset. And where does this come from? Because do you feel like you've learned this, like even just hearing you talk now about, you know, um, being the only, only female or only African-American female to walk into a boardroom of all white males. Do you feel like you have, through your career, gained the confidence to know, like, I'm going to bring exactly what I bring to the table. I'm not going to try to assimilate myself to what you guys want me to be. Like, where does that, has that always been there? Do you feel like you've learned that through your professional career? It's so interesting. My dad, he worked in Chicago. So he'd take the train every morning um, downtown Chicago. And he insisted on us living in the suburbs. So my mom, myself, my brothers, um, we all lived in the suburbs. We went to Naperville Central, which was voted the number two place to raise a kid in the United States. Like Naperville was awesome. But I was always like one or two, one of two black kids in the class. And then in the summer, I would go into the city and I would play on my AAU team and I would be, you know, be all black kids and maybe one, one white, ch- one ki- white kid. Um, I played overseas in Russia where you're the only English played in China where I'm the only black. So I feel like it's experience. It's like my entire life, I've been forced to be in these rooms and to operate. And when you're in that and you're uncomfortable, you become comfortable because you realize like you can connect with somebody through something. You just got to find it. And I think as you talk to different people, you realize like our values are pretty much the same. Like our desires, our wants, our needs are pretty much the same. And you know, I think that's from going overseas. That's from, you know, being the only, it's from going to the park and being the only girl, um, playing on the court, soccer. I'm the tallest one out there. So I stick out like a sore thumb. Like it's just, that's how it was. And it's about adjusting, but it's also being confident in like who you are. And I'm very thankful. My parents raised me to be proud of who I, who I am and proud of the size of my feet and don't hunch over because you're tall, um, everything. So I was, that was definitely something through experience, but also what I was taught. For sure. All right. We're almost done. We have two repeat questions that we hit. Um, and the first one is they say, work hard, get lucky. How much of your success is predicated on luck? I am a big believer that if you work hard enough, then the luck will come. Because if you don't work hard, you're not going to be in a position to have luck. Um, So I think some of my career for sure is luck. Um, But I mean, in essence, like we kind of hit the lottery in terms of just being here on earth and I know I'm going like big, big scale of things, but like I'm six, four, like that's pretty cool. Big feet, big hands can jump a little bit. So like, that's pretty lucky. I didn't really work for that, but the other stuff, um, definitely work for. <laughs> Do you like have a, a percentage question, but a percentage, um, I would say it's probably like 90, 10. Cool. I'm, I'm, I'm asking everybody percentage. Cause I want to like, see- what's your percentage? Oh, I'm, I'm probably like 80, 20. Okay. I would say, yeah. it cause I be think, it, I mean, I think I, I agree with what you said on, if you don't work hard, if you get lucky and you haven't been working hard, the luck isn't going to pan out to anything. You got to be ready for when that luck strikes and be able to take opportunity and make the most of it. Um, okay. Last question. You're a living legend, a future hall of famer, someone has, who has done and seen it all, where do you want to go next and how do you keep pushing? I would like to be, I always say, I want to be like the Magic Johnson of women's team sports. Like I want to be an entrepreneur. I'd like to be versatile in different 
things, whether it be entertainment, whether it be business, whatever, um, television, but I definitely want, uh, to be able to play with my kids. I think that's the biggest thing is just to be able to watch them grow up and play and be a part and be present. Um, so I think those are my, my two main, main things. And I want to live in Hawaii for a year. Does that count? Can I say that? Which, which Island? Oh my gosh. Maui. I really, I've never been to Maui. When I tell you that was like what got me and Layla through China it was like, we didn't want to go to China. It was our second stint there. It was not one of my better places to play, but I was like, okay, I'll go. Okay. So Layla at the time was like eight and she did not want to go, but she's, you know, she's down for the cause. And I was like, all right, well, this is, we're going to live in Hawaii one year. And I said when she was 11, but we keep pushing back the date. Like, we're not going to wear shoes for a year. We're going to live in Hawaii. And she's like, if we go to China, we'll do that. I'm like, yes. She's like, okay. So Wow, so this, her isn't, this isn't just like a want. This is a you have to because this was a no, promise. No, we have to. I made a promise, so <laughs> we got to. <laughs> I'll come visit you in Hawaii. Is that Please. allowed? Can I do that? Yes. Um, all right. One more question. You have basically had Layla throughout your whole career. What is it like to go through all of this with your daughter? You kind of touched on it before. Like she's your best friend at this point. It's unbelievable because she really sees the grind. And she sees the results. And if there's anything I want in life, we talk about working hard, but your kids have to see you do it. And to be able to share this experience with her, it's really cool because, you know, we won a gold medal and she tried to take my medal to school and I caught her. It was in her backpack and I pick it up and she's like, but we won, like we won the gold medal. So she really knows and thinks that she's a part of this. And so to be able to bring her along there are memories that she has that she brings up on a daily basis. And a lot of it has to do with this orange ball that has taken us all around the world. Be able to share that experience with her. I think it just gives me perspective and it's almost like she's a little mirror. because She's like doing what I do. And so kind of self corrects. Cause you're like, Ooh, don't want to do that. <laughs> I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> that's amazing. That's serious. That's so beautiful. Um, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for sharing everything and for who you are and what you've done and what you're going to continue to do. Um, so keep pushing and keep, keep fighting the good fight. I really appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. You're awesome. I wish you the best of luck as well. Um, please, you know, stay safe in the bubble. Yeah. I'll come, when, I'll come see you yeah. in Maui in a couple years. <laughs> oh, please, please. Let's go. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, Candice. Thank you.